Greetings, welcome back to Friday 13th Metalheads, I hope you're well. Today you're going to be watching an interview with a new band on Frontier Records, the band's called Withering Scorn, who have just released their debut album called Prophets of Demise. It's a fantastic full slap in the face metal album. Now this con interview was conducted by former Fates Warning bass player, Joey DeVarsi, and also Sean Drover, once with Eidolon and Megadeth. So in part one, we're going to be talking about the history of Fates Warning and Eidolon. In part two, we're going to be talking about the new album, Withering Scorn, so please check out part one, it's really interesting to watch. Thanks for watching, Metalheads. Be safe. Greetings, Metalheads. We're talking to the guys from Withering Scorn. We've got Sean and Joey. Welcome to Friday the 13th, guys. How are you doing, Jace? I'm good, brother. How are you guys? Finally great to meet you all and speak to you, and as you do. So how's your brother, uh, Glenn, Sean, at the moment? How's he doing? Yeah, Glenn's doing good. We're, uh, I think he's right now, he's on vacation in uh, Indiana, I believe. So, um, yeah. He's doing good. Please send my regards. So, guys, I'm going to ask you some warm-up questions first. So, as gr growing up as a musician, what, what came first? Was it the bass guitar or was it something else? And what age did you start to play guitar? Uh, yeah, I, I started playing bass straight on. Um, I was never a guitar player or anything. Uh, I started playing the bass when I was about 12 or 13 with some kids in the neighborhood because we were all massive Kiss fans and all we wanted to do was play Kiss music, and we needed a bass player. So I was uh, the odd man out. So you're playing bass, and that's how I started playing. So did, did you have any uh, brothers or sisters that were musicians, Joey, before you actually? No, no. Um, I have an older brother and sister, and they were not musicians. However, they're the ones uh, that got me into music at a very young age because they both uh, were all constantly playing music in the house, and especially on my brother. From, uh, he was into the heavier music at the time, you know, UFO and Uriah Heep and that kind of stuff. So um, I was one of the few 12 year olds in the neighborhood that was a UFO fan, you know, that's because I had, that's what I grew up listening to. Okay, what about you, Sean? What, who, who started playing the instruments first in your family? Was it your brother or was it yourself? And did it, was it drums your first love? Yeah, drums. I took up drums first. I mean, Glenn started with guitar. My older brother, Brian was a guitar player. My father was a guitar player. And I just, I mean, I, I play guitar as well, but I took that up afterwards. Uh, just, I just gravitated towards drums. And probably in the back of my mind, I probably thought, you know, if I play drums and Glenn's a guitar player, we can have a little band or whatever. And, and that, that is really what happened. But I just always gravitated towards the drums. I mean, you know, when I heard Rush, All the World's a Stage, I mean, that is what kind of the light bulb went off. You know, uh, and the transition from being a rock fan to wanting to be a musician was that was that record. So, but I mean, my my uh, you know my thing similar to what Joe just said. You know, just you know, listening to my older sisters, um, you know, Deep Purple records and and you know Kiss and you know Kiss was a huge thing for us and you know Queen and just the seventies rock bands. That's you know what we grew up listening to and and uh, you know. I still listen to it to this day. It's still really, for me, my favorite time period, I would say, would, would be 70s rock and hard rock for sure. So who's your influences then, Sean? Who's your influences, drummers? Well, Neil Peart from Rush, for sure. Uh, Roger Taylor from Queen. Um, those are my two big ones, you know, uh, growing up. Again, still to this day, I mean, they're, they're two of my favorite drummers. I mean, they're, you know, as soon as you hear one of their tunes you could tell right or i certainly could tell right away it's when you hear a queen tune you, you know it's roger taylor i mean right off the, you know he just has such a a great style and and uh same with uh, neil and stuff but uh you know i mean i can name you afterwards i can name you 50 other great drummers that that have influenced me and still do but those those were my top two for sure for rock would, would be uh, neil and roger taylor from queen mm -hmm. okay what about you joe what's your who's your influences as a bass player um, well, my big three or four, I would say, um, Geezer, obviously, um, John Entwistle, Steve Harris, and Getty Lee. Those four were my, my big four, you know, when I was first started learning how to play as far as bass players. Yeah. Geezer for sure. All four of them. Okay. So my next question for you guys is what was the very first band you was in? Can you remember the name and how good or bad were they? 
<laughs> I was in a band in uh, the eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade called, I think we were called Fire, very original name. And we played, obviously, cover songs, mainly Leonard Skinner and uh, The Doors and uh, some Blue to Cult, some Le- Leonard Skinner. We were pretty awful. Uh, yeah, so like seventh and eighth grade. That was my first experience. We played a big show at the high school gymnasium, you know, in front of a uh, hundred people or so. We thought we were rock stars. You know. <laughs> what about you, Shub? Uh, what was the first name of the band I was in in high school? Was I'm thinking? I think it was called GD Self, which was stood for great name. GD Self, <laughs> Gary, Dave, Sean. And our singer, we because he was short, we, he referred to himself as Elf, so we called the GD Self, which is such a stupid name. But <laughs> needless to say, we're we didn't make it. So now, you know, it, it, it's oddly enough, the, the first band I was in was not with my brother, and I can't tell you why. He went and played in another band in town, and uh, yeah, it was just it was weird how my you know. Qu- Apart from playing in the basement, you know, just guitars and, and drums, that was, it's not a real band, but the actual first band was not with my brother, which is kind of weird um, for whatever reason. But then eventually, of course, we ended up being in the same band and all that stuff. But, you know, the usual, similar to what Joe said, usual high school stuff, playing cover tunes, uh, you know, the stuff we could play when you're 13 years old, you know, easy Black Sabbath songs or some Ted Nugent and, you know, uh, whatever easy songs we could play. And as time went on, you know, and you progress as a musician, you can play, you know, tunes that were had a little more to them. But yeah, we, you know, playing Paranoid by Black Sabbath and things like that was was uh, what we were doing. It was it was exciting, really exciting at the time to be able to do that, you know, finally learn a song and be able to play it. That was that was quite a thing when you're 13, 14 years old, you know. So what was it? What was your first drum mate that you had done, Sean? What was your first drums? What did you get first? I had the worst drum kit in the planet i wish i still have them there's i literally bought them piece by piece from there was a drummer down the road um he was a couple of years older and he was a good rock drummer and he had tons of drums in his house uh just you know extra snares and extra this and extra that and and um he sold it to me i, I would work on the weekends and you know make i think it was i think i made 35 dollars a day a day when i worked on the weekends or whatever and i saved enough money to buy a snare and then i bought a bass drum and then i bought a, a rack tom and it was literally piece by piece and then i went to the uh the music shop downtown montreal steve's music and bought cymbals and uh, a bass pedal and and you know but I, mean, I was super proud you know i bought that kid with my own money i wasn't the spoiled rich brat kid you know and my you know my mom didn't buy me a five thousand dollar you know ludwig set and you know I, I bought that thing piece by piece and it was an atrocious kit but you know i was proud of it at the time you know i tried to I did the best I could with it, you know? So it was, I have pictures of it somewhere, but uh, yeah, it was quite, quite horrendous. What about you then, Joe? What was your first bass guitar? Uh, It's a real piece of junk I brought from the local, uh, local music store in my little hometown here. I bought with my paper, paper route money, you know, a $70 bass, no name. I don't even know what it was called. Then I moved on finally to a real bass. It was an Aria Pro 2. Um, I which at the time I thought well, that was a really cool bass. Um, and my third bass that I ever bought, I still have an old uh, Fender Precision. I bought, I had this when I was about 16, and I still use it. More of a knock around bass, but. Uh, did, he use it on, first... did he use it on the new uh, album? I did not. I did use a Fender, but a different one, a Fender Jazz I used, yeah. <laughs> Okay, then I'm going to ask you short about um, your, your band with your brother, your first band, Eidolon. I mean, back in the day, you guys did a cover of um, Fate's Warning. Uh, what does what does Joe and the Fate's Warning guys think of that? I don't even know if Joe knows we, we did that. Do you, did you know that, Joe, that we did Silent Cries? on just on, We made a demo cassette tape. Did, did, did you ever know that? No, and you're going to have to send it to me now. Oh, my God. Glenn, never... Dude, Glenn sings on it. Oh, my God. You know how hard that song is to sing, right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I can't sing it anymore either. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, 
yeah, we're all a little older now, but yeah, that's, that's, God, I forgot about that, Jason. Yeah, that, that's, uh, what was that, Sacred Shrine, Jason? Yeah, Is definitely, really? a demo, yeah, yeah, because it, it I, got forgo- on- I totally forgot about that record. I completely forgot about that record. Wow. I, need, I think, I, need it, to- I think it got on YouTube as well as like a bootleg. Is it? Because I need to listen to it. I don't remember any of it. I, really I got it. I got it. I got it from a guy, and I used to take trade with years ago. He sent me a demo of Idolon, and it had that yeah. song on it. And I was like, "Oh, fucking awesome!" Fates Warning cover. <laughs> well, I need to. I need to listen to that. Yeah, I haven't. God, that was like nineteen ninety three or something. Ninety four, three, something like that. Yeah, and that's. Uh, I think Glenn has it somewhere. He, oh yeah, Glenn. Glenn keeps everything, so yeah, he definitely has has that. You should tell him. You should tell him to to, to send that to you or whatever. Because that's yeah, we absolutely did that. That back in the day, it was, you know, we were still are, you know, just huge face warning fans. And, you know, but it was shocking to me, you know, when John left the band, John Arch was like, man, there's, you know, there's no way they can get another guy. And they got Ray, who is, again, an amazing singer, completely different singer, but somehow they pulled it off. You know, but to me, it was like, I don't know how they're going to be able to to pull this off without John Arch. And. And I mean, No Exit's one of my favorite records ever. I mean, that's just such a great record. But uh, yeah, I just couldn't believe how great Ray sang as well. But yeah, we're huge fans from, from day one, you know, when Nina Broughton came out. So it was fun to play that song. Now I'm trying to think of, think about when, such a long time ago. I think it was 30 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, yeah. Well, if you can't get a hold of it, you guys, I can always send you as a Dropbox song so you can check it out. Yeah. Yeah, You're gonna... yeah absolutely. Okay, then, so I'm going to ask you a little bit about um, your favourite album, Joe, with Fates One, and your favourite album with John, and your favourite album with Ray. Which ones are your two favourites? Well, um, okay, that's a tough one, because my favourite album with John, even though A Week in the Guardian was our was the biggest album, yeah, well, that's a tough one. I love Spectre Within. I think it's really heavy. It's, I love the heaviness of Spectre. But I'll have to go with Awaken the Guardian for the John side. It's just, you know, that's, that's really the album that put us on the map. And at the time was very, a very original sounding album. You know, nobody else really had done exactly what we did on that record. And, and we weren't really trying to do, do anything different. We weren't, at the time, weren't thinking we were making some progressive rock, uh, you know, masterpiece or whatever people say it is now but we just, just the songs we were writing and how it came out but uh in hindsight yeah that was a big album uh, for the genre you know so i have to go i have to go with awaken the guardian what about as as the, the, on the, the race era um I, I would say parallels is our most complete album our best sounding album i mean terry brown produced it what else can i say about that um but I think it was the album that should have made us big. It didn't make us big, and that that kind of sucks. But I, I you know, I think it's a great album. Eleventh, eleventh hour, and so many great songs on that record. And uh, that's probably my favorite all around Fates Warning album ever. Parallels. Well, I think I think Fates Warning. They're probably one of the most underrated progressive metal bands. They don't get the, the recognition that Dream Theater do. I think they're equally as good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate. So, Sean, sure, I'm going to ask you a question about Eidolon then. So, who came up with the name Eidolon back in the day? I did, because I'm a dumbass. <laughs> first of all, first of all, no, half, you're the only person on the planet, besides me, who knows how to pronounce it. Everybody calls it Eidolon or Eidolon or... Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, I again, you know, it's finding a band name is such a... a it's, for me, it's always been difficult, you know? So, again, Eidolon just means a ghost or an apparition, you know, or shadowy eerie things like oh yeah cool it's so metal and nobody could pronounce it so i i pisses me off to this day you know calling it that but yeah you know it, it, you know when you're a kid you know i've never been i never had just always had difficulties coming up with with uh with a, with a good name for a band you know so we had a difficult time coming up with with uh, withering scorn it took us forever to come up with a, a name for for this band it was that was the hardest part of making the record was was agreeing on a, on a band name you know so but uh you know i, I think withering scorn is a, a good name uh for our band but yeah i long was i, I wish i didn't call it that because no one no one could pronounce it or spell it for that matter so 
Right, okay, because the next question I'm going to ask you is like when you were, we first got in touch, Sean, when I first discovered Zero Hour through a, a, a company in America called Dream, Dream Disc Records. And I just mm. thought that album was amazing. I had to contact you and your brother, and we're like, we've been friends ever since. It's just like, mm. I love all the stuff that Idolon did. The first album was a total masterpiece for a debut self announced. Thanks, man. You there, Jace? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. A lot, I, I'm proud of most of the records that we did. Certainly from a musical perspective, for sure. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you you pretty much discovered the band from day one. So yeah, I mean, I've known you for over 25 years, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it's about correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that first album was amazing. It's just like it's like where do these guys come from? Why is nobody signed them up? I mean, and then you did the second album, um, Seven Spirits, which was equally as good. That was put out by yourselves before. A label signed you up from Milwaukee, I believe. Yeah, yeah. That record's never been released properly. I mean, you I think we made, I don't know, 100 copies, 200 copies, something like that. I mean, you're one of the few that have it. So, but Zero Hour was eventually uh, released again as a bonus disc, if you remember, for um, um, I think the how. And one of the records we did with Pat, I can't remember which one. It was it was a bonus bonus disc on there. And uh, Metal Blade put that out. So it was finally given a proper release, you know, years later. But uh, yeah, a lot of people like that record, you know. So, you know, it's pretty pretty solid first effort, I would say, for, uh, for us uh, on that record, for sure. It was a long time ago. It was 1996, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So what's your favorite Eidolon album, Sean, what you've done in the past? Do you have a favorite? Uh, as For a complete record, I would say the last one we did, which was uh, Parallel Otherworld. That's, you know, when we finally got the singer that a uh, top-notch quality singer how glenn and i viewed it uh we got nils um who's in a progressive band called peg is mine great friggin singer and and you know we felt that we finally got it right after all you know after six albums or however many records we put out i think that was our sixth or seventh record and uh and then we joined megadeth so <laughs> you know we did, finally felt like we we're doing that you know you know had a great record out and all that stuff and and uh yeah, then then uh, Megadeth came calling, so that that stopped it in its tracks. So that's yeah. my favorite one. That, yeah, you know. I mean the, the last album of Nils, I'm I'm good friends with the guys from Pagan's Mind. You did that King mm -hmm. Diamond cover, didn't you, on there? Yeah, yep, yep. We had uh, no, we did uh, we did Merciful Fate. That's it. The Oath. Uh, Pagan's Mind did King Diamond cover, and Glenn played uh, guitar solo on it. Played one of the guitar solos on it. So yeah, but, yeah, that was great fun playing the Oath. We had uh, Hank. Um, Hank Sherman and Michael Denner play their guitar solos on that. So that was that was great fun having them do that. We're huge Mercil Fate fans. So that actually turned out really well. That that that, that uh, version of that song, I think we, we played it quite well. Nils n totally nailed King Diamond's vocals, which is next to impossible. So he did a great job. So, Joey, what do you think of Idolon? What was your first impression when you first heard them? I never heard Idolon and still. I was in withering scorn because <laughs> um, I don't know. I was kind of out of the loop as far as metal for a few years. After I left Fate's Warning, I kind of dropped off um, the planet. Really, uh, <laughs> I wasn't listening to any new music or, or playing any music or anything. So the whole Idolon era slipped by me unnoticed. But as soon as I uh, joined up with Sean and Glenn, um, of course, I had to go back and check it out. And I, um, I like the album that uh, Sean was just talking about with no singing on it. I think it's a great record. Uh, I like Pagan's Mind, so I am. Um, that was I wouldn't be my favorite. And yeah. Joe, Joe didn't Joe didn't hear much about Eilon, and, and neither did anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but growing up when I was young, I was so into all the obscure metal and obscure bands and I used to go out and buy all the magazines and import records but there came to a point when like I said when I when I, after I left face I kind of just left the whole scene behind totally mentally everywhere I, so I, I did miss I did miss the uh, Eidolon bandwagon with along with everybody else apparently <laughs> me and Glenn dragged Joe back in <laughs> now he's back 